it going to work for everybody if we just have all the lights out? Okay. Everybody see okay? Okay, for these first ones, you don't have to simplify, but I will simplify as I'm doing them for people that do want to simplify to make sure that you have the right answer. The first thing that you have to realize in the first problem is that this is just a constant. So its derivative is zero. You did not have to put two to the one-half power there. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take the derivative using the power rule. And we're going to differentiate one term at a time. So this one I'm not necessarily going to use more than one color. So my y prime is the derivative of 7x cubed, which is 3 times 7x squared minus the derivative of 4x squared, which is 2 times 4x, and 2 minus 1 is 1. You can put the 1 down or not. It's up to you. Minus derivative of 5x is 5. The derivative of the constant is 0. You can put it down or not as you choose. And then if you cleaned it up, 3 times 7 is 21x squared minus 2 times 4 is 8x minus 5. Either of those answers is perfectly acceptable. The second problem is a quotient rule. And because it's a quotient rule, that means we're going to need to use y prime equals denominator times derivative of the numerator minus numerator times derivative of the denominator over the denominator squared. And it does make a difference. You have to lead off with the denominator because this is subtraction. Subtraction is not commutative. So be careful of that. So this one I'm going to use two colors. Here's my denominator. And the derivative of my denominator is 3 times 2 is 6x squared minus 2 times 5 is 10x. Because if you're going to have to keep using it, you don't necessarily want to have all these extra parentheses. So you probably want to kind of simplify your power rule stuff as you go along. <clears throat> and then that's my, the uh, that's the numerator, I'm sorry, yes. So there's your numerator and your numerator's derivative. This is your denominator. x plus 2. And your denominator's derivative is just 1. 1x. One the derivative of that is 1. And the derivative of 2 is 0, so it dropped out. So now for our rule, y prime is going to still wind up being a rational function It's going to be denominator here, denominator prime here, denominator squared here, derivative of the numerator here, and the numerator itself there. 
So leading off with the denominator, x plus 2. times n prime, which is 6x squared minus 10x. Minus the numerator, 2x to the third. Minus 5x squared. And I've run myself out of room almost, but fortunately my denominator derivative is just 1. So I still got it in there. Over my denominator squared. And that is perfectly acceptable. You can stop there. If you choose to simplify it, that's fine, but you don't have to. If you did simplify it, you would multiply this out. x times 6x squared is 6x cubed. 2 times 6x squared is 12x squared. x times negative 10x is negative 10x squared. And 2 times negative 10x is negative 20x minus 2x cubed minus times minus is plus 5x squared. And that's because I didn't need to do anything with the 1. And that's all still all over x plus 2 squared. Now if I clean this up, 6x squared minus 2x, I'm sorry, 6x cubed minus 2, 2x cubed is 4x cubed. Twelve x squared minus ten x squared is plus two x squared. And two x squared plus five x squared would make that seven x squared. And we have a minus twenty here. And that's all divided by x plus two squared. Now I would not have gone any further than that if I were you. Uh, 20x, yes, thank you. You can bring my x down. And that's actually how, they, how it was left on the test key. It's exactly the same as what that last step is. But again, this first step is all you had to have. See if I have any questions so far. This is fully uh, simplified. That's fully simplified. I could probably fiddle around and see if I could factor x cubed plus 7x squared minus 20x. I could factor out an x, see if there's anything I can do. That's just more work. It's not going to look any better when I'm done. Okay? So moving on, whoops, that's number seven. We need number five. Yeah, I've got five and seven here. Where did number three go? I think they're out of order. Maybe it didn't copy number three. I tried to copy them larger so that it would be easier for you to see them. Apparently it did not copy problem number three. So we'll work from here. So there's number three. K of X is equal to 5x cubed minus 1, but that's in parentheses. So the outside function
is a power rule. And this is a chain rule problem. And the way I remember the rule, without writing down a generic form of it or a variable form of it, is that you take the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. Because it's usually pretty easy to tell what's inside and outside. But you may have to practice that. So my outside is parentheses to the sixth power. And my derivative of outside is six times what's in the parentheses to the fifth power. Then I have to take the derivative of the inside. And this is what's on the inside, five x cubed minus one. So the derivative of the inside, which is 5x cubed, minus 1, is going to be 3 times 5 is 15x squared minus 0, which we won't write down. So for the outside, we take this 6x parentheses to the fifth, put what was inside back inside, and then multiply by the derivative of what's inside. And then simplifying that is okay if you want to, but you don't have to. And what you do not do is multiply that 6 through these parentheses because you have to apply the exponent first. And I wouldn't even want to multiply out a fifth power polynomial. That would take a while. <clears throat> I can multiply 6 times 15. 6 times 15 is 90. X squared. 5x cubed minus 1 is going to stay right where it is and put the fifth power up there. So would, would us be 6, 5x squared minus 1, fifth power nope. minus 15, would that be acceptable? That's acceptable. This is perfectly acceptable because that's where the calculus occurred. The only thing I did was multiply this times this to get that. So that is perfectly acceptable. Okay? <clears throat> so let's look at number four. Number four is a product rule. I think most people got that right, but if you didn't, your dividing line on this product rule is right here. Because you've got a 4x squared, which is a function of x, and then you've got a 3x minus 2 in parentheses to the fifth power, which is also a function of x. So in this case, I'm going to divide it up into f and g. So this is f. And f's derivative is 2 times 4 is 8x. And then this is g. And g is a power rule with a chain rule in it. So the first th thing you're going to do to get g prime is you're going to 
bring that power down in front, keep watching the parentheses, reduce the power by one. So she needs the chain rule. So what's in the parentheses is 3x minus 2. And the derivative of what's in the parentheses is 3. And since you're going to have to use it, it might this time be easier to say 3 times 5 is 15 times 3x minus 2 in parentheses to the fourth power. <laughs> And now you're ready to do your product rule. Product rule says take F, the first one, times the derivative of G, and then take G times the derivative of F, add them together. First times the derivative of the second plus second times derivative of the first. So for y prime, we have f, which is 4x squared, times g prime. plus g times f prime, which is 8x. And you do not have to clean that up. It's probably simpler if you don't. Sure. Yeah, this way. That's why I was making the bigger ones because it's easier to slide them back and forth. There you go. Now, if you want to clean that up, go ahead, but I didn't. I actually just didn't. I didn't bother. Okay? The answer in the back of the book, or the answer in the, since these were actually in the back of the book, the answer in the back of the book would have been y prime equals, and you don't even want to know what came in between this. 4x times 3x minus 2 to the fourth power times 21x minus 4. And that was way more trouble than I wanted to go to. So I would have stuck it out right here. Because there's like six steps in between this and this. And it's all algebra. So stop with the first step. Okay? That comes from the derivative of the inside of the oh, function. Remember, oh. this is chain rule. Okay. Okay? I don't so, know why I kept getting myself to do the lever. I think that was something I was going to chain, chain rule, and the problems that I'm going to give you, I'm going to try to give you some where you only have one rule per problem. Okay. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. one took two. But I'm going to try to give you practice where you do one rule yeah. per problem mm -hmm. because you need to get the rules down pat before you can start combining them. Okay? If you have questions anywhere along the way, please stop me and ask your question. Because the purpose of this is to help you understand. I don't know if you understand if you don't tell me. Okay, our next problem
is a quotient rule So we have a numerator we have a derivative of the numerator and then we have a denominator which happens to be a chain rule problem. So to find the derivative of the denominator, we keep the parentheses, drop the power by one, bring the power down in front. And then because it's chain rule, we take the derivative of what's inside the parentheses. And then what's inside the parentheses is simply 4t minus 3. So there's your four pieces. And remembering with quotient rule, we always lead off with the denominator. multiply it by the derivative of the numerator. And it's a subtraction problem. So then we begin with the numerator. and multiply that times the derivative of the denominator. And since four times four is 16, it'll make it easier if I write it this way. And then all of that is over the square of the denominator. And the only thing you had to do there was put that in brackets and put a two on the outside of it. But several people did go ahead and simplify it somewhat and just had, had that this was 4t minus 3 in parentheses to the eighth power. And that's okay. It's okay to do that, but you don't need to. Now here again, they went through like 16 other steps and came up with a lot smaller thing that didn't look a bit better to me. So I left it alone. Questions on that one? If you haven't noticed it yet, my take on simplifying if you've got two constants hanging in there that you need to, that are multiplying times each other, well, let's just combine them into one. But if it's something where you're going to have to factor or multiply out and, and gather like terms and factor again, no, leave it the way it is, okay? If you want to simplify, do the simplest possible things. The complicated stuff really winds up causing you trouble. <coughs> Everybody okay so far? Any questions? Now's the time to ask. Yeah, you could. It's okay to do that. I mean, that, that's one of those simple things. It would be perfectly all right to transform this into this. And that'd be good. That's fine. 
I just don't think we would need to do the one, two, three, four other steps they did. Because what they did was they multiplied some stuff out and they collected the like terms and then they factored out a common factor. And they still wind up with a fraction that has one, two, three, four terms in the numerator over that denominator. So I don't know how that looked any better. We only had four things in our numerator. Okay? Are we ready to move on to the next one? I don't want to go too fast. I want everybody to be sure they understand. Okay. This is not a product rule because there is no variable between the negative 4 and the e. The only thing going on here is the e to the x. But the e to the x, the power is actually a function of x. So it is chain rule. So what you're going to do is you're going to take the derivative of negative 4 e to whatever that function is, and I'm not even going to put that little power up there, but you're going to take the derivative of that. And the derivative of that, e to any power, its derivative is e to that power. And the negative 4 comes along for the ride because it's coefficient. But then the chain rule part comes in because you have to actually take f prime, which is, since f, since f is x squared, that's going to be 2x. You're going to multiply this derivative times 2x. So there's the derivative of the outside. Here's the derivative of the inside, which is the power. And the power in your final form is going to be negative 4e to the x squared, because that's what its power was to begin with, times 2x. And if you want to clean that up, that's okay too. That's negative 4 times 2x is negative 8x e to the x squared. But don't leave out the x. Several people got this all right except they left out their x. They forgot the derivative of the x squared is 2x apparently. Or they just miscopied. So this is fine. This is okay too. Whichever one of them you want. Either one is correct. Questions on that one? Trying to wait till I don't see any more pencils that are going out there. Okay. Oh, there's my other problems. He copied them two sided, I didn't realize that. Okay. We're going to look at number seven now. Number seven is what kind of a rule? Product rule, because you have 7x squared, which is a function, and e to the negative 3x, which is also a function. So your first function 
is f equals negative 7x squared, and its derivative is negative 14x. Your other function, which I'm going to call g, is e to the negative 3x. And its derivative is e to the negative 3x times negative 3. And you can write that as negative 3e to the negative 3x if you choose. It didn't matter to me which way you did it. So g was actually chain rule. And you did its derivative. So now doing the product rule, it's first derivative of the second plus second derivative of the first. So the first term, negative 7x squared, g prime you can write it that way or you can use this version of it, either one and then plus g which is e to the negative 3x times f prime negative 14x if you wanted to go the extra step negative 7 times negative 3 is negative 21 x squared e to the negative 3x plus negative 14x can go in the front e to the negative 3x so this is fine or that's fine they're both the same questions on that one Any questions? The negative 7 times the negative 3. Ah, thank you for saying that. That should have been positive. My bad. Any other questions? Okay, it would have been perfectly okay here instead of having both those signs just to have a subtraction sign between them two. That would have been okay. 
Any questions? I think I may offer you guys extra credit to come and talk to my finite class because you could explain to them why it is they need to learn how to do all that algebra that they learn to do. Remember when you were learning all that algebra thing, you go, why do I need to do this? Now you know. Hmm? Yeah, there's reason, but you don't see it then. That's right, you just gotta suck it up and deal with it. Okay, we're ready to do the next one. Okay, the next one is quotient rule. And again, this is where a lot of you are having trouble. You'll get that first term and then you'll forget that there's another one out there. Okay, there's two terms. So we have a numerator and we have a denominator. And the rule says that we take the denominator times the derivative of the numerator and the numerator times the derivative of the denominator and it all goes over to the denominator squared. Where the two in the top are added to get, or I'm sorry, not added, put the wrong sign, subtracted. That is a subtraction, okay? So we'll do a little side work here. This is the numerator. This is the denominator. The derivative of the numerator is going to be chain rule because 2x minus 1 is not the same as x. It's a function in x. So we're going to have to take its derivative as part of the process. But the derivative of the natural log is 1 over whatever you're taking the natural log of. And then we need to take the derivative of what is inside those absolute value bars and the derivative of 2x is 2. And that is much easier when we get ready to use it to write it as 2 over the absolute value of 2x plus 1. That way you don't have to write two things and use a couple sets of parentheses. And then the denominator is easy for a change. That's the derivative of x plus 3, and its derivative is just 1. So the denominator squared out here is going to be x plus 3 squared. The derivative of my denominator is 1. My denominator is x plus 3. My numerator is the natural log of the absolute value of 2x minus 1. And the derivative of my numerator is 2 over the absolute value of 2x plus 1. And there's plus sign between them. I'm sorry, not a plus sign, a minus sign. Keep trying to make that minus into a plus. Okay? Now, if you really, really, really just can't stand it looking like that, you're welcome to clean it up however you want to, but I'm done. Okay? I'm done. 
Anybody wants to see all the simplifications, I got the whole key up here. You, you're welcome to come look. But I want to see that step. And a lot of y'all, if you noticed, I'll circle that first step, put a check mark, and I'll probably squiggle through all the rest of it because you did something in all the rest of it that didn't match what I had. But I didn't count off for it because you tried to do that. I just made sure you could do the calculus. As long as you could do it, you got full credit. That's the way it works. Okay, we're ready to go on to number nine. Okay, our instructions here, I want you to read these carefully and I want you to think through. This is a process. This problem is actually very straightforward and it can be very, 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 very easy even if the function is ugly. But you have to understand the process because there's three steps to this process of what they're asking you to do. The first step is to find the slope of the tangent line. which means find y prime. Find the derivative. Algebraically, this one is easy to find the derivative of. Derivative of eight is zero. Derivative of two x squared is two x. So y prime equals negative two x. That's the formula for the derivative for any x value. Find the equation of the tangent line means you need to find the slope of the tangent that touches that curve where x equals 1. So before you do anything else, you need to find the point of tangency. Because you need not just the x, but you need the y. So find your point of tangency. In other words, substitute x equals 1 into y. And that means your point of tangency is the point 1, 7. x equals 1, y equals 7. Your third step Find y prime at x equals 1. That's the slope. Y prime of 1 is negative 2 times 1 is negative 2, and that is the slope, which we normally think of as m. Question, do you want to substitute x equals 1 into y? Do you mean into x? First step 2. Uh, no, I meant substitute x equals 1 into the y equation. Yes, yeah, into the y equation, and that's what this y equation is. Okay? So what you have here is you have a formula for the slope, which you use to find the slope of the line. 
we'll just, we'll just tangent to the curve at that point. What they're wanting you to, to do is to find the equation of the tangent line. If you have the slope of the tangent line and one point on the tangent line, you can find its equation. There's two different ways to do it. I do not care which way you do it. Method one. Use the slope intercept form of the line. Y is equal to seven. Slope is equal to negative two. X is equal to one. Find B. Negative two times one is negative two. Add negative two to both sides, you get nine. Nine is equal to B. There's your equation. Some of you are very familiar with and very able to use the slope, the point slope form, and I'll let you do that if you want to. It's y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. And in this case, y1 is 7, x1 is 1, and m is negative 2. Slope, x value is, is equal to 1, and when it's equal to 1, the value of the function is 7. So y minus 7 equals negative 2 times x minus 1. Y minus 7 equals negative 2x plus 2. Y equals negative 2x plus 2 plus 7 is negative 2x plus 9. Same equation. So whichever method you chose, it didn't matter. And there wasn't any middle ground on this one. People either knew exactly how to do it and got it right or sat there and stared at it and made either major arithmetic mistakes or had no clue what to do and tried to do something. And if you got, did anything meaningful, I tried to give you credit for what you did do. Okay? Any questions on that one? You will see that problem again. That's a useful problem. There are many applications of that kind of problem. Anybody still taking notes? Okay. I'm going to actually move this in a minute. It says find the marginal average cost of each function defined below. And then the best hint that I could give you, and most of you took it, was that you should recall that average cost is C of X over X. Okay? These were 10 points each, five points for finding that and five points for finding the derivative of that. So the first thing you need to find is the average cost.
There was your first five points on that one. You had to have that. Because if you didn't have that, you couldn't go any further. So this is the average cost. You need to take the derivative of the average cost to get the marginal. And that's because marginal is the rate of change in whatever the thing you're finding the marginal of. If it's marginal cost, it's the rate of change in cost. If it's marginal profit, it's the rate of change in profit. If it's the average cost, marginal average cost, is the rate of change in the average cost per item. And that translates into being the rate of change or the cost of making the next item after the one that you've made. So it's the cost of making the next one. Cost of making one more. But right now we need to find the marginal cost. And we can find the marginal cost on this by taking the derivative of the average cost function, the marginal average cost. So we need to find C average prime of X, which is the marginal cost. Now, in order to find that, you may do this two different ways. It's up to you. The first way would be to do this as quotient rule. And what you probably are going to want to do is take into account that this is the same as 3x plus 2 to the 1 half power. That will make it easier. So when we take the marginal average cost using the quotient rule, quotient rule, we always start out with the denominator. We always square the denominator. And then out here on the other end, we're going to take the derivative of the denominator. And that's going to be 1. And then we're going to work with the numerator. And the numerator's derivative is 1 half times 3x plus 2 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half. And then we subtract the derivative of the numerator, I'm sorry, the derivative of the denominator times the original denominator. Yes? Oh, uh, yes you do. Yes you do. I left that out. Thank you. This was chain rule, so I need to take into account that the derivative 3 had to go out there, which I think might just have clicked in my brain where somebody got 1.5 for something. I got that. Okay. I, it may not be wrong. Let me look at it again because I sat and puzzled over that one for a while. Now, if you change everything back into radicals, that's fine, but there's no need to. You don't have to. That right there would have gotten you the full five points. If you tried to simplify it, I tried to figure out if you simplified it right. If, but if I saw this first step and saw that you did the first step right, I left it. The problem is some of you do the first step and you simplify within the first step and I'm sitting there trying to figure out where you got what you got, which may be what I did to you. Because I remember looking at that one for a while. Yours may actually be right now that it occurred to me where that 1.5 came from. 
Yeah, well, I think, tell me what you actually have on yours. I, I don't have my test. Oh, you don't, that's I right, because I didn't get it. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, this, this whole thing is to the negative one half power. So if you tried to do much simplifying, it really got ugly. If you take the x, the one half, and the three, one half times three is 1.5 times x, and then you have 3x <coughs> plus 2 to the negative one half power. There's not anything you really need to do with this. So leave it alone. And there's nothing you can do with that either. Now some of you converted it back to radicals, that's okay. Don't convert this back to a radical and think because it's negative it can drop down here because it can't. It's only one of the factors and you have to be able to drop everything down, not just one piece of it. So this can't drop down to the denominator. Okay? That's why it's better to actually leave it right there. And then C of X is 4X plus 3 raised to the fourth power for the next one. So we need to find the average cost function. So that means first thing right out of the gate, find C average of X. And that's going to be 4X plus 3 to the fourth power over X. And then you'll need to take the derivative of that. Exactly the same when we took it up here. It's a quotient rule. And the derivative of your numerator is going to involve the chain rule. So here's your numerator. And n prime is going to be 4 times 4x plus 3 to the third times Derivative of 4x is 4. Derivative of 3 is 0, so we'll leave it alone. And it's okay to just go ahead and call that 16 times 4x plus 3 to the third. And fortunately, the derivative of the bottom, the denominator, is 1. So now we'll apply our quotient rule. Quotient rule says take denominator square the denominator and leave it in the denominator and then take the derivative of the denominator out on the other end. So it's denominator times derivative of the numerator. minus numerator times derivative of the denominator. And the only cleaning up that you would want to do of this would be to multiply that 16 and that x or somebody tried to, and I don't remember, I think more than one somebody, so I'm not going to single anybody out here. A couple of people tried to actually factor that, but you can't. You can't cancel that common factor because that's not a factor. That's a factor of the term. You can't take an x out of this unless you can take one out of that, and you can't. So you're going to have to keep that x squared on the bottom. But you can put the x and the 16 together. And get that far. Okay? Now that still leaves us with two more problems, which I will do with you next week because I think we're coming up close to the end of class. Those of you that want to come get your test, just follow me across to my office. I do have them in my office and they're in alphabetical order, so it shouldn't take long to give them to you.
Y'all, I meant to bring them and I just got out without them. I was worried about bringing y'all these tests to practice with. Um, in my math class, are you still going to change uh, some of the homework grades I have in there that we've worked over? Remind me to look at yours, yeah, because I've still got emails and they're probably still marked on red to remind me to go make those changes. Just email me or send me something to remind us that, hey, would you please be sure and make sure you gave me all my homework Okay. Because yeah. I you. know that I might have cheated you on one or two and I just, I'll have to go back and look and see which ones it was. All right. Okay.